I'm Dr. Margaret Lafferty, live from the 2017 Hot Topics in Neonatology meeting in Washington, D.C. I'm joined today by Dr. Roberto Romero, and we're here to discuss his talk on clinical chorioamnionitis at term. Welcome, Dr. Romero. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Dr. Romero, can you tell us about the main objective of your talk? Was to discuss new findings about the microbiology, diagnosis, and clinical correlates or clinical chorioamnionitis at term. And can you tell us what, more about these new findings? Sure. Um, so the first is that uh, clinical chorioamnionitis is the most common infection-related condition in labor and delivery units around the world. It affects 5 to 15 percent of pregnant women in labor. It has implications for the mother because it increases the rate of puerperal endometritis and also for the neonates because they are at risk for neonatal sepsis. Okay. And what we what I presented today is a number of studies that we have done to examine this common and well-established problem by examining amniotic fluid obtained by transabdominal amniocentesis. And some of the findings were unexpected. The first is that we consider the clinical chorioamnionitis diagnosed by the presence of fever and then other signs like a maternal tachycardia, fetal tachycardia, were pretty reliable diagnostic signs for infection. And we found that in our study, using amniotic fluid culture and molecular microbiology techniques, only 60% of all women diagnosed to have clinical chorioamnionitis had actually intramniotic infection defined as a presence of a microorganism and inflammation in the amniotic cavity. 24% of the patients did have intramniotic inflammation, but we couldn't find an organism. And we termed this condition sterile intramniotic inflammation. And yet, another surprising finding is that in 20% of the cases, we have no evidence of either infection or inflammation in the amniotic cavity. The inflammatory process was in the maternal systemic compartment in her circulation, but did not affect the fetus and newborn. So in the 60% um, or so of women who are actually diagnosed, um, how often is the fetus affected? So the f that would be the fetal attack rate. Mm -hmm. And I want to distinguish term gestations, which is what I presented today, in one of our studies that is unpublished at the present time, we look at the proportion of patients who have a positive amniotic fluid culture or bacteria in the amniotic fluid and the frequency of positive blood cultures in the neonate. And the rate was between 3 and 6%. Mm -hmm. This contrasts with the frequency of bacteremia in a preterm neonate that was determined a number of years ago by doing amniocentesis and chordocentesis and the frequency in preterm neonates was 10 percent. These numbers contrast with those that are reported in the neonatal literature. So, you know, it, perhaps we need to consider that we are not looking for the organisms, genital mycoplasmas are not generally cultured in neonatal practice. Speaking of the organisms, what are the organisms that we worry about in chorioamnionitis? Well, if one reads textbooks, chapters, and original articles, the organisms are E. coli, group B strep. In our study, what we, find, what we found was that the most common organism was Carnarilla vaginalis, that is present in the lower genital tract of uh, pregnant women. And the Ureoplasma parvum, Ureoplasma ureoliticum, was a very, the second most common organism. So genital mycoplasmas are important both in preterm gestations and in term gestation as a cause of infection. That's great. Um, can you tell us more about the design of your study? Yes, it was a prospective observational study in which women who were diagnosed to have clinical chorioamnionitis in the labor and delivery unit because they had a maternal fever plus another sign such as fetal tachycardia, maternal tachycardia, an elevated maternal white blood cell count, or foul amniotic fluid um, uh, were considered as indicators of clinical chorioamnionitis. 
women were offered an amniocentesis to diagnose infection, and then amniotic fluid, maternal blood, and umbilical cord were analyzed for markers of inflammation and the presence of infection using molecular techniques and cultivation techniques. Then how about the outcomes of this study? So the outcome, because this is an observational study, was to redefine, to re-examine the prevalence of infection and the microbiology of infection in patients diagnosed to have clinical chorioamnionitis. And the main conclusion of the study is that clinical chorioamnionitis, as we diagnose it today, is a heterogeneous condition that has three groups of patients. The ones who have confirmed intramniotic infection, 60% of the cases, a group that is completely new, undescribed, a new entity that is intramniotic inflammation without organisms, and then another group of patients in whom probably the mother has an epidural, and then 10 to 20% of patients with an epidural develop a fever during labor, but that is a systemic inflammatory response. It has little to do with the fetus or with the amniotic fluid inflammatory state. How do we explain that second group, the group with the intraamniotic um, inflammation? So that is a very interesting question because the question is uh, why do we have intramniotic inflammation in the absence of bacteria? Mm -hmm. And in immunology, there is now a great deal of interest in this condition that is called sterile inflammation. It occurs in patients with gout. Patients with gout have inflamed joints, but they don't have infection. In that case, urate crystals act as a danger signal and stimulate the immune response to generate inflammation. So um, it is believed that non-microbial signals can stimulate inflammation and generate uh, conditions of cellular stress or necrosis. And we are now conducting studies to determine what are the danger signals that operate in the amniotic cavity, but we have identified such alarming. So the important concept is that there is a new condition mm -hmm. that was not recognized before, mm -hmm. in which there is intramniotic inflammation, there is histologic chorea, but it's not caused by inf an infection agent. And the clinical implication is that a large number of patients are receiving antibiotics and perhaps some of them do not need them. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Romero. Is there any other one sort of main takeaway point that you would like the audience to get from your talk? That clinical chorioaminitis is a complex disorder, is more than infection, and uh, we need to implement new modalities to be more precise in the way we diagnose clinical chorioaminitis and intramniotic infection and that that can be accomplished by examination of the amniotic fluid. Today, that will require an amniocentesis, but we have developed also non-invasive tests to collect amniotic fluid when the membranes are ruptured, and we believe that that is one of the frontiers ahead. Great, thanks very much, Dr. Romero. That's it for us here at the 2017 Hot Topics in Neonatology meeting in Washington, D.C.